Welcome to Sector Report. I'm David Beetson and this week sharpening up our shearing, improving the information flow between gate and plate and converting the possum from pest to profit. New Zealand may produce the world's champion shearers, but shearing contractors now aim to lift their game. The red meat sector looks for smart growth with help from smart IT systems. Farm IQ gives a year one progress report. And can the pesky possum give New Zealand a competitive advantage? We're unique in that we have possums and we have possums in abundance. <laughs> New Zealand currently pockets $100 million a year, blending possum fur for sale with other fibres like merino wool. And at the same time, we spend around $60 million a year dropping 1080 poison to eradicate the critters and the spread of bovine TB. For years, the arguments raged on between fur hunters, farmers and conservationists over the best way to manage the country's possum problem. But now the price for possum fur has hit a new record high, $135 a kilo. The old argument has taken on a new life, as our rural affairs correspondent Drew Chappell discovered. The possum predation is surprising because while we know they attack small young and eggs, taking an almost fledged juvenile care is quite a surprise, and the possum hauled it out to the entrance of the nest and ate it in front of the camera. Possums are, in a word, pests. No doubt about it, they destroy our native forests the habitat of many endangered species and spread disease, most significantly tuberculosis. Possums first arrived on our shores in 1837, brought here intentionally by, who else, the Aussies, hopeful of establishing a roaring fur trade. What they ended up establishing was a monumental plague. It's estimated there are around 50 million of them in New Zealand forests, but no one really knows for sure. What we do know, however, is that they make great clothes. It's a very soft fibre and it can be spun into very fine yarns. So you've got these lovely possum merino sort of yarns that come through and you can make really fine fabrics and, and fine knits out of it. So they're warm, they're easy to look after. It's just a really good for product. Claire Silliers is the CEO of Textiles New Zealand, an industry that many believe would be long gone were it not for our furry marsupial invaders. It's at the front end of niche products, at the front end of niche manufacturing. Mm. So it's, it's really, really important that we actually start focusing on possum and not sending it offshore as a commodity product. Because it's not a commodity product. We should be putting it into yarns, we should be using it and actually making our own textiles out of it. One man who certainly wouldn't be doing quite so well if it weren't for possums is Steve Boot, who owns the country's largest tannery here in Woodville, near Palmerston North. It is a uniquely New Zealand product, you know, and there's, there's virtually nowhere else in the world they can get the raw material, and we need to keep it here as much as we can. We need to keep it here, and we need to make sure that there is investment here, there's jobs here, there's wealth creation and, and income generated here, rather than just sending it offshore for someone else to have a crack at. This is possibly the largest specialised possum tannery in the world processing more than 25,000 hides and skins annually. That's a fraction of the total possum kill. The fur industry alone accounts for around 2 million animals a year, but they are fast breeders. We've got possums, they're here. And forget about eradication, because at the end of the day, if anyone's, anyone says to you, I, you know, we're going to eradicate possums out of New Zealand, um, really, it's neither fiscally or um, technically possible, okay, it can't be done right at this stage, it's just they're always going to be here unless there's some radical change, okay, so let's just forget about the eradication side of things. Possums are going to have to be managed. The fur trade at the moment is worth around $120 million for New Zealand and Steve Boot says as the only country with a significant wild possum population, we have a unique opportunity on the world stage. There's nowhere in the world at the moment where fur has taken off an animal like, a poss like the possum and it's actually removed off the skin and it's blended with fine merino wool and I mean, the, the blend's now uh, possum, merino, a little bit of silk, a little bit of cotton, it's a blended yarn and actually turned into apparel. Okay? There's nowhere in the world that's done. Possum is unique in so much as that it is um, hollow in that context. The fibre's actually hollow, so it's really light 
it's hollow, so thermally it's really efficient. And it's a unique industry to this country. The industry is in somewhat of a boom period, Asian demand driving global fabric and textile prices steadily upwards. These numbers filter down through all levels of the supply chain, to the point where many farmers are choosing to invest in a few traps or bait stations of their own, given the extra money to be made. Collection points like this one in Whangarei is where wool yarn producers meet hunters to do business. And at the moment, business is good. Zero. Rip me off. <laughs> Again. Chris Tudman is a full-time possum trapper. He's selling almost 50 kilos of fur gathered from hundreds of traps set up around Northland. At almost $150 a kilo, he's making the most of his unique corner of the market. That's a typical sort of fortnight for me. So, but yeah, you've got to get out and do the job. That's the thing. You can't sit and sit at home and <laughs> you've got to get out there and do it. It's yeah, and it and it is a full time thing. Yeah, it is. It is. Like most professional trappers, though, he's seen some hard times and says the fur market has survived only on the back of hard work and persistence from small companies like Basically Bush. To guys like Chris, the big returns now are just reward for sticking through thick and thin. I'd love for it to go up a lot higher, but <laughs> everybody would say that, but uh, the price at the moment is a really good price. But Basically Bush, the company that I supply, um, you know that they've done a really fantastic job of finding the markets and keeping the company going. You know um, that they've seen the potential that there is a business out there for it. And there's a demand for it, so you might as well utilise it. The vast majority of possum fur is then sorted and blended into yarn with other natural fibres such as silk or merino. The yarn is then dyed and winds up at places like this, the Manawatu Knitting Mills here in Palmerston North. These knitting mills have been around for more than 120 years, making garments for New Zealand's police and armed forces, among many others. Claire Silliers says wool mills like MKM wouldn't survive if we didn't have possums as a point of difference. We're unique in that we have possums and we have possums in abundance. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, and having possums in abundance, um, we're actually able to harvest them and actually use that fibre. You know, in other countries like Australia, they actually protected species. But here we're actually able to use them and actually use them to our economic benefit. Drew Chappell reporting. Coming next, how the red meat sector could achieve some smart growth from smarter information technology. Welcome back to Sector Report. Well, how is the red meat sector going to grow its contribution to the economy by $8.8 .8 billion between now and 2025? The key part of the industry's growth strategy is to build a better flow of information between the farm gate and the consumer's plate, along with a comprehensive database and IT systems that will help farmers find the best practice benchmarks and new pathways to improve their meat production. Silver Fern Farms, MAF and Landcall Farming are all engaged in a $181 million partnership to develop Farm IQ. The system builders have just finished the first year of their seven-year development program and Farm IQ's chief executive, Collier Isaacs, came in to give us a year one progress report. Well, Collier, thanks for joining us. Thank let, you. Let, let's start. You're one year into a seven-year program, effectively. Uh, you must be somewhere along the journey. Okay, where are you at and where are you going? Where we're at, well, as you say, we're one year in and it's seven years. And I think the, the trick with this program in some respects is that it's a R and D program and so we're sort of learning and building as we go. So where are we now? We've uh, spent quite some time building the building blocks. So, you know, market research, um, product development in the marketplace, putting a whole lot of technology into a processing plant so you can trace animals back, got the base and the genomics sorted out 
built a pilot database and got the on-farm things just starting to roll. So we've got the building box in place, and now we're sort of going to build on top of those. OK, I mean, one of the things you've obviously been doing to, to get this far is to actually go out and talk to farmers about the kind of information services that they require. Now, have you had any surprises, or what have you learned out of that process? <laughs> we have talked to farmers a lot, that's for sure. In fact, we put together what we call a technical development group, which is kind of a big set of words, which means get farmers in the same room as us and work out what they need. Um, have we had any surprises? Probably um, not massive ones, but it certainly fine-tuned a few things because, you know, quite um, expectedly, I suppose, that when it comes to putting information into a database, unless you're going to get something useful back out, you know, unless you basically exceed the piss offedness factor for getting stuff in by a value of information coming out, you don't go far. And so what that's made us do to our pilot database is put a whole lot more reports in it. So you've got a whole lot more analytics, a whole lot more ways of actually analysing your data to work out what's going on. And I guess we thought that we might it might be okay in the pilot to get away with a simple system, but um, yeah, that, that's not the case. I mean, that sounds a bit geeky. Yeah, it's are the, geeky. Are, are the early adopters geeks? Pretty geek e farmers. Um, it'd be fair to say they're more comfortable with um, with probably computer systems or more comfortable with information than than the average farmer would be. Having said that, I know there's quite a few, I guess, I don't know if you call them geeky farmers, but um, that are looking over the fence seeing, well, how's this thing going to hang together? But yeah, I would say that the, the current adopters are probably more, more comfortable with things like EID tags and technology. OK, if, with the seven-year programme, I mean, your objective is clearly stated. You want to create a demand-driven integrated value chain uh, from the red meat consumer to the farmer. Yep. Now, from the consumer to the farmer. At what point in that seven-year development process would you say you'll have done that bit? Um, well, the whole program's broken down into three phases. So the first bit is sort of um, <clears throat> is design and, and, and build. The second two years after that are really um, are refining it. And the last couple of years are about sort of scale up or rolling it out. So you'd have to say that if we weren't reasonably confident of having built a system in, you know, by end of year three, then, um, then you might say, well, we're not going to make progress and you'd, you'd call it quits. Although, looking at it now, I'm, I'm confident we'll get there. Well, give me the feedback. You, you're getting at the end of year one. Presumably, you, you are providing analytic tools. Mm. Uh, you are providing research data. Uh, what kind of feedback are you getting from those early adopters? The guys that have you know, structured their on-farm information so they can um, or put it together so they can learn about what the differences are, they're coming back and saying, I never thought that um, there was such a big difference in growth rates in a, in a similar line of lambs, for example. So they've been comparing lambs that have come off um, you know, one as stores from one farmer compared to another one and just looking at the differences. But, so they've seen differences between the farmer supply, but what I don't think they actually thought about was the differences within those farmer yeah, supplies. Yeah, well, that's interesting. I mean, how many farmer members have you got involved at the moment and how much farm stock are you actually covering in the various sectors that you're active in? Well across the whole um, shooting box there's 250 farmers involved and if you added up all the tags in the database now there'd be north of 400,000. So um, that's, that's, a re that's any amount of um, farmers and, and tags that we could um, sensibly manage now and if you're just trialling as you build you don't really want um, too many people on board otherwise you're um, enough to learn not so many they crush you effectively yeah. <laughs> with yeah. weight numbers. One of the things that uh, you, you're talking about is actually getting the consumer end input. Mm. How are you going on that? I mean, what do you do to tell a New Zealand farmer what uh, a UK or European or North American or, or Asian consumer is thinking about when they get their product and what they want? Yep. Well, the the program originated with a whole lot of market research in various, in various markets, not surprisingly, to try and work out what the consumer at a generic level thought was important. Um, what you've seen now is some pilot programs. So there's Soil Fern Farms branded product in retail in New Zealand. Um, and so we've got a lot of feedback from consumers in that space. And we've also launched um, back in September this, a similar line of product, but a bit different in the UK in, well, well, in this, case. This is all pretty critical to the success of the mm. red meat sector strategy because it's got to be driven by what the market and the consumer are telling you. Absolutely. Um, have you, again, been surprised? And two, are farmers taking this seriously when they get that information and thinking, OK, I've got to actually do something different on my farm because I see what the consumer wants now? I think, um, are we actually getting any direct consumer feedback right now? I mean, we've got the system, system set up, so there's a, there's a reasonable... There's a, that, there's a process so that you can. I mean, we've got iPhone apps and goodness knows what else going on inside the marketplace. Um, have we transmitted a direct consumer requirement, you know, back directly to a farmer or based on 
related to tracing product directly through, not yet because those systems don't exist. Have we managed to transmit back to farmers what's, you know, have we confirmed with farmers what's important to a consumer generically? Um, yeah, I think we have. Mm -hmm. And even the fact that we're involving these systems, whether it be traceability or sustainability systems, um, all those things are part and parcel of keeping a consumer happy. It's just a question of how much more refinement you need to go down to really, you know, actually get the consumer to be to the point where they'll pay more effectively. What would be the critical mass you need to actually start delivering the full range of benefits that you are designing this scheme to produce? The first option on high-end meat contracts, access to systems to identify and improve animal performance, advice on forage, animal health uh, treatments, regular insight into consumer feedback. There's a range of yeah. things that you've got to try and do. Yeah, yeah. It's not probably so much the, um, the scale of things in the first instance, it's actually making sure we've got the systems that work. And so the first three years, we'll, we've got those systems worked out, then we should be fine on that front. After that, it becomes, um, becomes scale up because from a farmer's perspective, if they're comparing productivity, you want enough farmers and so that farmers can see sort of like for like. Because you don't want a farmer and, and you know one farmer in North and one farmer in Tiamuda and another one in Bluff, because that won't make any sense in benchmarking. But so once the systems are built, it's really in, in filling to make sure that you know you've probably got you know, representative sample of New Zealand farms. Yeah, you know, probably at least a thousand farmers, I'd thought. So three years sounds like a pretty critical milestone for you. It, yeah, it, it absolutely it is. Yeah. <laughs> Wish you well on the journey. Thank you. Thank you very much. Kalia Isaacs, Chief Executive of Farm IQ. We're back after the break to see how sharing contractors are sharpening their act. That's next on Sector Report. Welcome back to Sector Report. Well, wool trade representatives, sheep farmers and shearing contractors have been involved in a nationwide round of consultation. With a dramatic recovery in wool prices over the last year, they're talking about the development of a new quality assurance system to ensure that shearing and wool preparation and presentation practices match the increased value of the clip. Shear New Zealand is a quality program built by the industry to provide accredited operators who can deliver a consistent high level of service that will maximise the farmer's market return. And last week, Mark Barrowcliffe, the executive member of the New Zealand Shearing Contractors Association, gave us a briefing on the project. Mark, thanks for joining us. We've got world champion shearers in this country. Why do we need a new quality assurance scheme? Well, a couple of years ago, we were sort of faced with um, declining sheep numbers. Um, there was an uncertainty in the wool industry. Um, the levy vote was um, was out there whether to keep the wool levy, and it was uh, the wool levy was lost. So, we in the New Zealand Shearing Contractors Association decided what can we do to add value to our clients. Mm -hmm. Presumably, the flock was down, the clip was down. Uh, were people losing experience and losing edge, or is it, are you seeing a necessity to really lift the game? Yes, well, we've carried on with our training and trying to keep um, the level up high, but we, generally across the industry, we'd felt that everyone had gotten quite blasé with the wool, right through to the, um, the farmers selecting just a single uh, trait for their genetics. Mm -hmm. The, the wool was just a, turning into a byproduct, really. A great natural fibre was becoming a byproduct. Well, the great natural fibre seems to be having a comeback with prices now. Uh, what are farmers saying to you now? Are they actually conscious of the need that they're actually going to be a bit more careful about how the wool turns out? Yes, there's definitely a lot more interest there. Um, we, we've got to get back to basics with, with their breeding. We, as um, in the shearing industry, can um, can only help their product once it's been cut off. But we need the, the we need the farmers to breed a, a good product for us to enhance that product moving forward. Okay, so where are you going to put the focus? You've got a range of skills that are required all over the place, yet you've got a fairly casual sort of workforce. Yeah, definitely. Um, we're we're focusing this. Uh, NZ shearing, shear NZ, sorry, on um, on the contractor. Mm -hmm. So the contractor will be will be audited his systems and everything that he puts in place, or he will be held accountable. So he he is the one being audited. So when he turns up to the the farm, it, it's up to him to um, make sure that his workplace is up to standard. He has the staff to do the job required. They're suitably trained, and there's been a lot of communication 
prior to the shearing between the farmer and the wool buyer to enhance the clip. And that, that will sort of identify any issues that are likely, they're likely to encounter as they go through the job? Yes. Okay. Um, when you talk about qualifications, um, my understanding is you want to be at world's best practice level. How do you actually determine what world's best practice is? Well, we've got in, our, in the industry, we've got um, the New Zealand Shearing Best Practice Guidelines, which is a, a document now. Um, that been out for a while? It's been out for a while. It's available through the DOL. Mm -hmm. We've got the world's best training system, and that's internationally recognised. Okay. Uh, I mean, are there particular gaps in, in knowledge and skill that you're going to be focusing on? We're always um, on training and upskilling our staff and any, any um, gaps that we identify will, will be um, picked up and, um, and those staff will be upskilled. But you're always bringing on new staff and upskilling them as well. Mm -hmm. It's, it's a, always an involving process, people going out the top end and coming in at the bottom. Do you think that it will all get more professional? It's definitely Ever. getting... Or is it always going to be a bit casual? It's definitely getting more professional all the time. We look at the way guys train for records, the way they, they mm. eat, the girls with their wool handling. Um, but the casual nature of it is also good. It, it's a good, fun family workforce. Yeah, uh, you, you talked about the consult, uh, consultation going on. How far through that process are you? Because that's really where you're going to pick up the gaps, where you are going to pick up the, the needs that people have for training. So, so how far is that advanced? Yeah, okay. We've gone through um, a lot of consultation. It's, it's coming to the end now. We've had seven regional meetings involving um, contractors, uh, the wool industry, exporters. Um, we're hoping that come 2012, early 2012, well, we will have 8 to 10 million sheep signed up through contractors to get Share NZ up and rolling. Right, so at that stage, presumably you're really aiming for some form of certification so that you can actually sit down and say, well, you qualify for Shear NZ's mark, which says you're competent to do your job and you'll do it to world's best practice standards. But, uh, but how long will it be before you actually finalise that sort of accreditation program part of the exercise? That, that'll be all finalised in early 2012. Okay. okay. Any particular things that have, have thrown up in the consultation that surprised you? No, coming from the industry, starting at bot ground grassroots as, as I did, it's, it's stuff that I've experienced throughout my whole life. But it's good now being in, in meetings with um, wool buyers, exporters and all of that, we're all talking and they're all throwing their, um, their two cents worth in and, and issues that um, affect them and ultimately, ultimately affect our whole industry. Okay, well I mean, what sort of things are on their mind when they do that? Well, you take, for example, um, use of secondhand wool packs and clips. Um, it, I know now that it used to annoy me when I was pressing the bales because you'd press and a bale might blow open or something. But I now know that if that bale looks all right, when it's rolled off the truck later at the wool exporters, it could blow open again there. And, and it's a big issue for them as well. Right. One of the, the things that uh, I'd like to know about is, is how is the development of the program being funded? I mean, given that you've had a situation, you know, years in which things have been pretty depressed, how did you get the dough to get it going? Well, basically through the NZSCA, we'd, we'd identified this program that we wanted to get up and rolling, and we were doing it in-house, um, it, it was in no particular hurry, only um, because it took us time to get things up and running. And then we, we soon realised that, hey, this industry is in a pretty bad way. And the more we put our idea to the people in the industry, people just, they loved it. And, and they're saying, come on, guys, get this going. So we were coerced into um, applying for funding from um, <laughs> beef, beef and lamb now after the, wool yep. the, the vote was lost. And we've obtained funding from the residual wool levy for the next um, three years to get this program up and running. We've presented a model that will be um, self-funding after three years. It's a sliding scale. We've obviously had a good bit of funding at the start to get this thing up and going. So who, who actually funds it in the end? It will be self-funded by, self -funded the, shearing by the shearing contractors. Yep. Okay, long term, Tell me this, what's going to happen to the contractor who doesn't actually measure up to the sheer ENZ standards? Oh, I think that they'll, um, a lot of them are there anyway and they're not going to take too much more to get 
to get to these standards and we've got systems and and that already in place that we can help these guys and it's not going to take them very much at all they don't realize it book work scares some of them but we've kept that to a minimum three years is going to be self-funding do you think in three years farmers are going to be turning around and saying have you got that share nz certificate <laughs> you accredited i hope so yes <laughs> i'm sure they will Okay, Mark. Yeah. Well, we'll track it and we'll see. Thanks for your time today. Thank you, David. Mark Barracliffe, Executive Member of the New Zealand Shearing Contractors Association. And that's all for now. Remember, you can catch our show again anytime at country99tv.co.nz. Thanks for your company. I'm David Beetson for Sector Report. Bye for now. Mm -hmm.